All right. Well, I like rambunctious songs, so glad to have that one. Rambunctious is our word for the day, too. See if you can use that three times today uh, as you walk through that. I love that. Uh, my name is Greg Kauser. I'm one of the pastors here. It's good to see each of you here. Um, one of the things that um, I had reflected, uh, Van and I, it's interesting that um, over the course of the week as I'd reflected on the events that had happened this week and uh, in the spheres of my influence in different areas had uh, put out uh, on a social media account a reflection on Psalm 10. And Psalm 10 is a, a psalm for this moment. It's a psalm of lament. Uh, lament is a posture uh, that is called for by Christians in the face of real tragedy and difficulty. Uh, and it also reminds us of our limited capacities to understand all that God is doing at any one moment. Uh, but it's allowing us before God to be honest with him about our confusion, our frustration, our difficulties, our fear, our helplessness. Um, and I really encourage you, um, when you find yourself in a, in a moment of real tragedy or difficulty or suffering, um, as the people of God, the very first thing that I would encourage you to do is to flip open the book of Psalms, go to a psalm of lament, and work out the deep struggle that you have in the presence of God before you take it out on someone else. And work it out and, and tell him your heart, your feelings, let him minister to you in the moment. One of my favorite psalms uh, in particular that you see this happening in the psalm is in Psalm 73. And Psalm 73 is the psalm of Asaph. And Asaph was the director of the worship in the temple. And Asaph had a free fall in terms of his faith. And he looked around and it seemed like everybody who was cursing God, everybody who was walking away from him, all the arrogant and proud and the boastful, that they seemed to be fat and happy, right? In the ancient world, to be fat was a good thing. Uh, they were fat and happy. Uh, and they were prosperous and doing well. And Asaph, the first half of the psalm is a literal freefall. It's a faith freefall. And he falls right down to the bottom and he winds up by saying, well, maybe I've just cleaned my hands for nothing. Maybe I've followed God for nothing. And in that moment, Asaph pauses and he says this, which is interesting. He says, if I'd just gone out at that moment, if I'd just gone out in that moment in my despair and when I'd kind of lost my way and lost sight of God, I would have destroyed and harmed many people. And he said, so I went into the temple. I went into the presence of God and I was reminded that God is a just God and one day, one day, justice will be served. No one gets away with anyone. One day he will awake and all those who seem to be powerful, they will disappear like a dream. And God is my only portion, and I have him. So I want to encourage you as you do that. And walking in the Christian life, and this is one of the things, too, that I think that's always difficult, uh, and sometimes our bent takes us one way or the other, but we're, we're constantly in a position as followers of Jesus where we're rejoicing with those who rejoice and we're weeping with those who weep. And we're struggling to, to find the balance between that. So the last two days, Ron and I were at two different weddings, rejoicing with people that were connected here to EBC. One of them was Mike Pereira, who attended here for his four years while he was in college and has stayed there. Now he's down at Southern Seminary. He met Allison, and we went down to celebrate their wedding, and it was a sweet uh, celebration of God's gift to them, of knowing Mike and knowing how God has grown him and developed him as a man. And that was a sweet thing. Then yesterday, uh, we celebrated uh, Juliana and Alex's uh, wedding, uh, Juliana Smith. And so it was a sweet day of celebration to see them come together as a couple uh, and as a family to see uh, a daughter that you had prayed for your whole life uh, to not only love Jesus, but to link arms with a man who loves Jesus. So we celebrate with those who celebrate and we weep with those who weep and we find ourselves doing that sometimes in the same day and sometimes in the same hour. And so God give us wisdom as his people to love well uh, in the moments that we're in, the complicated moments that we're in. Well, today uh, we're going to reflect on a little bit about what it means to be a part of this body, what it means to be a, a member at Emmanuel Baptist Church, and what it really means to be a part of the body of Christ. Uh, and as you're aware of, we're in a, a little bit of a series 
that's a kind of an interesting series. It's not something that we usually do at Emmanuel. Uh, usually you'll find us uh, located in some book in the Bible, working our way progressively through it. And just to kind of uh, give a little uh, glimpse of the future here, we, our intention is to do something this fall and next spring that's something that we really haven't done to that length at all. We're going to try to teach our way through the book of Romans, through the, book of, uh, through the fall and the spring. And so anybody who's read the book of Romans knows how simple and easy the book is, so it won't take us much time to kind of probe its depths, right, in terms of that. But it's going to take us a while to go through there, and we want to, we want to hang in there. We want to find out what Paul has to say to us. Uh, and one of the, the seminal books in the New Testament that's responsible for so much of the teaching and doctrine that undergirds our identity, who we are, and our practice, what it means to be the people of God. So we, we're going to do that in the fall. So if you're thinking ahead, right now, I myself am prepping for that. So I'm reading, uh, I, just in my own background, I'm translating the book of Romans over again. I've probably done that I don't know how many times, but I'm doing that a little bit every day uh, to get myself ready to rethink about the book of Romans again. Uh, and it's as complex as it was the last time I read it, very carefully, uh, as I look there. So that's what we're heading here. But, but today we're going through a series and we're calling it Rest and Remember. Now the rest part is we're getting ready, by God's grace, we're getting ready to put to rest the mortgage on this building, which I don't have enough time to tell you all that that means for us that have been around here for a while. And that is a miracle of God that we're doing that and that we're doing it ahead of schedule. Uh, even last week, just to your encouragement, last week we had our final building for service offering and it was close to $16,000, this last one. And we're just, uh, I'm, we're, we're just right there and I'll, I'll be very happy even though we won't have the real papers here, but we'll have something to represent at mortgage and we'll be glad to see it go up in flames uh, here. We love our bank. We love the people that have blessed us over the years, but we're happy to sever that kind of relationship with them uh, over the time. But so we're so thankful for that. So we want to rest from that phase of the life of Emmanuel that put us into this building. But at the same time, we want to come back and remember. And so we want to come back to do something that's indicative of the people of God. And if you read, read Scripture, if you just type in, as I put here, you go to BibleGateway.com, and you put the word remember in the search bar there, uh, it'll come up with a ton of verses in the Bible that call the people of God to remember. Remember who God is. Remember what He has done. Remember who you are. Remember what he's called you to be. And those are the things that are very, very important. People that forget are people who lose their way. People that forget are the people who lose their way. And so we're trying to reflect on, as we move toward our anniversary, those moments in the past, to use a phrase from Acts chapter 15, where it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us as a church to launch off in a particular direction or to emphasize a particular truth or to shape ourselves in a particular way. And so today we want to talk about the concept of membership uh, that's been consistently a part of Emmanuel uh, for all of my involvement here and really from the beginning of the time at Emmanuel. And so, beginning of the time of Emmanuel altogether. But a couple, couple three things, and I reminded you of this last week, Remembering is an important practice for individuals and groups, right? All, you see it all through Scripture. We want to acknowledge that every good thing that's happened at EBC has been a part of God's grace and mercy. And we want to give Him credit for it. And we want to acknowledge it. We want to reflect over it. We want to see how God has moved and shaped us. The second thing is to look back on what God has done and how He's moved us encourages us to do that again today. We want to make sure that whatever we do, whatever programs we put in place, whatever emphasis happens here, that it's consistent with what God has called us to do as His people. And so we want to look back on that. And then it helps us as a community to be reminded of who we are and how we operate, right? We mentioned that uh, in almost any church, in any country around the world, about 80% of what happens in a church is a matter of wisdom. Right? Wisdom is the church coming together, reading the Bible, and trying to decide how to operate as a community in a way that seems consistent with what God has called us to do and to be. 
right? And so if you go over to Togo, West Africa, you'll find a little bit of a different twist on that. If you go over to Russia, you'll find a little bit of a twist on that. If you go over to any different country, they'll have different practices. I was in uh, the church yesterday, the Lutheran church yesterday, uh, Alex Church, and it was a gospel preaching, uh, Christ-believing church. And I was l- looking at their different practices in their wedding. Matter of fact, I went down to the wedding of Mike and um, uh, uh, Allison on Friday, and we had a very different procedure where they started off, and they came up, and they had the intent to be married, right? Is it your intent to do such and such? Yes, it is. And then they had all the bridesmaids and the groomsmen up here, and then right after that was done, everybody went back and sat down. And then they had a service where they went through some readings, and then they had the little sermon, And then when they got to the vows, they called everybody back up and off they went again, right? Well, that's not the tradition of the way that we have usually done that here at Emmanuel or in the things found, but that was a different way of going about it. But is there in Scripture, thou shalt run a wedding ceremony thus? And the answer is no, right? Any more than there, here's how you organize your Sunday morning service, Right? Thou shalt have, Jamie's has this in hers, thou shalt have a violin. I think that's a very good thing too. No, that's not there. There's no strings, there's no any things along, thou shalt have those, but those are things that we incorporate in our worship, and they're matters of wisdom. But that's what makes us a, the people that we are, that shapes us as a given community. We have our own household rules, just like every house here has its own household rules. And knowing what the household rules are helps us participate as a family together. And also, uh, to use a G.K. Chesterton quote, the way we do things, if you, the, his analogy was to talk about them as fences. And his picture was you're running through a forest and you come on this fence in the middle of the forest. And you're thinking this is kind of impeding my progress and, and maybe we should just tear it down. And Chesterton's uh, caution was, well, before you tear it down, maybe you should ask why it was put up to begin with. Maybe you should ask me to put up. And when you come to a community, you're going to find out we have certain practices maybe that you didn't have in the community you came from, or you come in here and you find certain practices and, and you did it differently or you don't understand why it's happened. Before you go after it and say, this is ridiculous, we shouldn't do that, maybe you should ask why the fence was built. And that's what we're talking about a little bit here. Why do we have membership the way we do? Why is it a public commitment? Why do we ask you to give your testimony? Why do we even ask people to make a formal public commitment to the church altogether? What's the wisdom behind that? And that's what we want to talk about a little bit today. So, throughout the history of Emmanuel, membership included a voluntary and public covenantal relationship with the other members of the church. So we have had the same covenant for all those years. Matter of fact, if you read our covenant today, it will remind you that it was not written recently. Okay? Even though John Whitmore regularly uses the word deportment, I don't regularly use that in my conversation. Uh, John's always talking about proper deportment, uh, but I I don't usually use that. No, John doesn't use it either. Uh, He uses other complex geology terms, but uh, we don't use those. So if you read that, you'll find yourself, it's like this is a little snapshot from the past, and it really is. Because the, the, the covenant that we use the, the agreement that we hold each other to as members in the body of Christ was actually written back in the mid-1800s, and it was written by a guy by the name of Reverend J. Newton Brown in 1833 in particular. Now, he wrote it for his church and for a group of churches in New Hampshire where he was a pastor in the American Baptist Church denomination. And so he wrote it there, and people began to hear it about it, his other fellow pastors, and they urged him to publish it. And so he published it in a very cleverly titled, uh, uh, you know, document. Here's the title of it, right? This, you can tell this is from the 1800s just because of the title, right? Baptist Church Manual containing the Declaration of Faith, Covenant, Rules of Order, and Brief Forms of Church Letters, right? That's a catchy title, right? Uh, In terms of that, it's very descriptive of everything that's in there. It even has little letters to help you, uh, you know, if you're changing churches, a letter that you might want to bring, or if you have to discipline a member, a letter you might want to send them, right, or things along those lines. So it's a very practical little tool. But in that, he wrote the covenant that we use. And when he published it, it was 20 years later, 
in about 1853 when he published it. Then it began to be used widely by a number of Baptist denominations, and it still is today. Matter of fact, the covenant that we have at Emmanuel is the same covenant that John Piper's church has, Bethlehem Baptist uh, in Minneapolis, St. Paul. So it's not something that's unique to us, not something that's here, but it represents the wisdom of the church, really, over the last couple hundred years about what it means to be a member and how to go about kind of structuring the inner life of the church. Now, two things here before I get into the particulars of what led us to keep that as a covenant, and matter of fact, recently to renew our commitment to it. So this is, this is uh, the title here for this morning. Let's see if I can get this to go move forward one. Somebody help me back there. Okay, good. So it seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit to call us anew to covenantal community. So we've reemphasized this in recent times, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But what does it mean? Reasons why. A couple things here. To be a covenantal community means that to be a member of a church, a believer voluntarily and publicly enters into a particular type of relationship with that church. The covenant spells out what the obligations and privileges of membership involve for both the person coming in and the people who are already here. And so even that language, privileges, usually when we think of membership, we think of privileges, right? So I got a membership in Amazon Prime. It gives me privileges to free shipping, right? It gives me access to the welter of things that are available out there in the jungle that is Amazon, right? So all that's out there, that's the privileges. I don't think of my obligations. My only obligation is, of course, to pay for the things that I have. But I don't have any responsibilities to behave in a particular way, to do any certain things. I don't have any connection to other people that are on Amazon. I don't really care about them, right, just as long as they don't get in my way when I'm trying to order whatever I want, right? Those are the kind of things I don't have any connection with them. But the other side is not only do I have privileges, but I have obligations. So some of the privileges I have, I have the privilege of having a group of people pray for me. So this week, and I, I said this earlier, Barry Skelly just sent me a little note. I'm not doing this to pump Barry Skelly just because it happened, that, that I'm praying for you today, Greg. And he said, I also pray for you at times when I don't tell you that I'm praying for you. I said, well, I expect that, Barry, but thank you for that. It was a super encouragement to me. I, I, I'm privileged to have people pray for me. I'm privileged to have people care about my soul and care about my family and come up and talk to me and say, Greg, how are things going? How are you doing? And to pray for me and care for me. I'm privileged to have a group of people that if I know something happens to my family, they're going to show up to help me because they've done it already. I have the privilege of that. And so I have all those kinds. I've had the privilege over time of having people love on my daughters and some of them lead them to Christ. I've had that privilege of people loving on them to do that. So I have all those things that have come to me, but I also have obligations, right? So I told John when he came in and his van prayed today that I was praying for John and Lynn as they go through this very difficult time. I have an obligation to them to pray for them. They are my family member. It's not somebody else's obligations. I don't pay somebody else to do that. I, I owe them my concern. Yesterday was one of those obligations that I, I, I wanted to fulfill happily is to be at the celebration of an important event in the life of the Smiths. Right? I wanted to be there for that. I wanted to enjoy that with them. My presence is a part of me expressing my love for them. Right? So this morning with Mayor Mays, right? so Sarah Mays, uh, as I see here this morning, I look at her. One of my obligations is to pay attention to her as my sister in Christ. And so we just talk and ask how she's doing, and she'll ask me the same right? Because that's one of my obligations to care for the people, to care for Rhonda and Walter, right? And those people in my life. So privileges and responsibility, and so I have those that spells them out. And the reason why that we want to spell them out is at least three or four things. I'll mention them quickly. It provides a basis for our unity, right? What are we gathered around? What are we called to do? What are we trying to get after as the people of God? Well, the covenant tells us what kind of people we're trying to be. So we want to be unified in that, and the covenant guides us in teaching and discipleship. Right? This is something I'd really encourage you. I don't know if you read that, uh, the covenant. We're going to read it today. But the covenant, if you're thinking about another brother or sister in Christ and you're trying to evaluate because you love them how they're doing, the covenant is a good grid to use. Because the covenant talks about the kind of behavior that you expect from a person who's following Jesus. It talks about the kind of goals they should have. It talks about the way they should be speaking to each other and about each other. It talks about the kind of activities they're engaged in. 
And it should be something that we use in each other's lives to encourage each other to be those kinds of people for each other, right? So the language that it has here. So it's a basis for our unity. It's a basis for our teaching and discipleship. And then if it has to be, it's a basis for our discipline, right? So we have had to do that on occasion at Emmanuel. Thankfully, not a lot by God's grace, but we have had to do that when, when people have stood outside of their mutual commitments to us and lived in a way that's over against what they have committed to do and to be. And because we love them and we believe that the covenant ultimately is rooted in biblical principles, we call them back to that obligation and we must do it because they're our brother and sister. And my obligation is not only to encourage you when you're doing great, but to warn you if you're walking away from Jesus. It's a part of my obligations to do that. So those are the reasons why. And so from the earliest time, Emmanuel has had a covenant to try to structure it. Now, it doesn't mean that we've always kept it perfectly. It doesn't mean that sometimes it has been broken, right? One of the sad things in the history of EBC in almost any church that's existed for the length of time that we have been around, there have been moments where the church was threatened by division and where it, it was... It was, it was weakened and it was wobbling on its feet. And God in His mercy has preserved and moved forward in terms of that, both people who have left and people who have stayed. But uh, there have been times when it's certainly true that we have been less than faithful in keeping our covenant obligations to each other. Right? So, but that's characterized us. So most recently, and I recommend this book to you if you want to think about the book that's kind of helped shape a lot of the elders and what we've been thinking recently is a book by Mark Dever, or Dever, depending on how uh, you spell, say his last name, D-E-V-E-R. Uh, he's the, Baptist, uh, the pastor of a capital Baptist church in uh, D.C. He's also associated with an organization called Nine Marks, people may know of. Uh, but his book, The Compelling Community, uh, is a book that is a most recent one that we engaged. This is back in about 2017, 2018. We, uh, we read that uh, together as elders began to think about, and we retooled our membership process. We rethought through. And so what I want to take you through just briefly today is the scriptures that stand behind and guide uh, why we did what we did uh, and that shape the church covenant. And we're going to look at that briefly today. Uh, and then we're just going to ask how we're doing as the people of God with it, okay? Now, first, I want you to look at this first passage, and it, you have notes here today. Uh, this looks uh, suspiciously, where's Rick Hilliard? This looks suspiciously like Greg Kowser, the professor today, in those notes. So if you look at those notes, I, I want you to go away with a lot of material that you can reflect on and think about. I want you to, to keep this material because I want you to think about as, as members at Emmanuel what it is that you're signed up for, right? One of the things that happened to me twice, Friday and Saturday, right? You know when you go to a wedding and if you're paying attention, men and women, right? If you're paying attention to the core of the service, it takes you back into the vows you made to your own spouse, right? It takes you back. And you remember that day when you were just pumped, you were so excited to be there, you were full of hope, and right? And Ron and I, right, that was uh, just yesterday, 39 years ago, right, in terms of that. And so as we're thinking about that, you stand there before there, and this is what, and I, I listen to those vows every time, and as a pastor, I, I, have, I have said them for people to repeat them after me many, many times. I'm going to do it this next weekend and the next week after that. I got two weddings coming up. And every time I say them, I think about those. To have and to hold until death do us part. For better or for worse. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. Right? Even in the vows, of, and to bestow my deepest affections on you and you alone until death do us part, right? Every time I step back into those, it reminds me, and, and it's, you know, Greg, how are you doing? And often it's, eh, so, 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 right? But it's reminding me of my obligations. And, and I believe in those vows, and the reason why I ask men and women to say those vows is because I believe they're rooted in what Christ teaches about what marriage is. 
Not because it's just a, a nice ceremony, but because it's rooted in deep wisdom that's been honed through the church through centuries that said this is a picture of what marriage looks like that is a picture of how Christ loves his church. That's what it ought to look like, right? And so those vows take me back. And for us as a church, sometimes we forget, right, because we get bombarded all the time about what a member is. And a member is somebody who just gets what they want and a person who pays for certain privileges and then everybody caters to them. And members are primarily consumers. Well, when you think of a church member, a church member is primarily a producer, not a consumer. They're coming changed by the Spirit of God, gifted by the Spirit of God, called by Christ to invest in the lives of other people. Right? So they're coming to engage. And so this is one of the ways when you find a mature believer, one of the things you find when you find a mature believer, they just walk into a church and they're looking as a believer how to get engaged. They're not waiting for everybody else to do something. They just, they've got obligations and things to do. So they're in and they're meeting people. They're going after it. I don't, they don't have to be an extrovert, but they're getting engaged because they're a part of this body. They're going to, they're going to get involved. Someone who has a wrong sense of membership is a person who walks in and is constantly an evaluator. They're a fan in the stands. They're a consumer shopping for religious goods. So the idea of membership helps us to get reminded about what God has called us to do and to be. So this is what we want to look at today. Now, I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 5 with me for a moment. We're going to go to a number of passages today. Some of them you'll recognize as ones we've been in the past. But I want to, I want to develop some of the biblical principles that lie behind why we do what we do. Okay? And why I encourage you to do that. And why it's our house rules, if you will, the fences that we have put up to kind of guide and structure our lives as a church in terms of that. And again, we don't stand unusual in terms of that. We stand right in the stream of many, many churches. Now, a couple of things. I'm going to look at two different passages here that give us a couple insights about what it means to be a church member. And one of them is explicit in Hebrews 13, but in 1 Corinthians 5, it's it's lying underneath the way Paul expects the church to operate in a very dark situation that has to do with discipline, right? We've spoken of this passage before. It's an ugly passage where a man is engaged in sexual relationships with his stepmother. And the church is aware of it, and the church is proud of him. We don't have to, time to go into the circumstances of that, but it's a, a very dark, very difficult situation and Paul is, a, you know, Paul is appalled. How about that? Paul is appalled at the fact that they haven't called this guy out on it and that they haven't reached into his life to save him from this darkness. And underneath a lot is that, well, the church then has an obligation to pay attention to the spiritual health of other people? Yes. The church knows who they're obligated for? Yes. The church can't just stand back and ignore it? No. And so you're going to find here, and then we're going to draw a couple insights from there. Then we'll go to Hebrews 13 and draw a couple more. So here's chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. And you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? For my part, even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit as one who is present with you in this way. I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing this. So when you are assembled and I am with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That uh, interesting phrase there, I think what Paul is teaching here is that you need to treat this person because they're living in open, unrepentant sin as if they belong to a different kingdom. Okay? And the goal always of discipline, as it is in any healthy, loving family, is to restore and reclaim the broken person. That's why Paul continues and says, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord, so that he might be reclaimed for the cause of Christ, for his blessing for the reputation of Jesus and for the blessing of the people of God. You, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? And so here he says to them, you know, to let sin 
a person who's rejecting the authority of Jesus, walking away from him in open, unrepentant way, to let that happen is to unleash a force within the body of Christ that could undermine the health of many people. Right? Just like yeast goes all the way through a lump of dough. Now then come to verse 9. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and the swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. He's not saying here church discipline does not apply to unbelievers, people who do not know Jesus. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are not you to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. Okay? Now, two insights here from 1 Corinthians 5. So many things we could say. But churches have an inside and an outside, and Christians are supposed to know which is which. So if I'm accountable, right, for you as a brother and sister, I need to know that you're a brother and a sister. And if you're here and a part of this body, I'm accountable for you in a unique way. I'm not accountable for the people at Grace Chapel in the same way I'm accountable for people here, or the people at Grace Baptist in in Cedarville, right? Right? or you name the different churches, or Calvary, or whatever. But I have an accountability for this family in the same way as a dad. I had a special accountability for Jacqueline, Francesca, Victoria, and Dominique. I have a special accountability. As a husband, I only have accountability to one wife, Rana. But I have a special relationship that's there. And with this church family, I have a special relationship that if I see someone who gets caught in a sin to use Paul's language from Galatians 6, and they're getting caught in it, and they're moving away from it. I need to go after them for their sake. So I I should know who they are, and then Christians are under the authority of the church and are to be excluded if they persist in living in open, unrepentant sin. One of the things that we do as a church member is I put myself under the authority of this body to be held accountable to our mutually agreed upon standards. Now, let's go to Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13 So flip over a little bit later in your New Testaments, come to the end of the book of Hebrews, and let's read a couple things here. Now both of these passages, they're talking about the nature of the body of Christ and how it should operate, but both of them bring up things that are just very, very uncomfortable given our contemporary moment. No one, no Christian should ever take the discipline, meaning the uh, pursuing another person who's caught in open, unrepentant sin, that should be taking a journey on your knees with tears and crying out with God in mercy, both for courage and for their repentance. It's never anything that's taken lightly or taken with joy, right? But it's something that's absolutely essential for the protection of the reputation of Christ the health of the body of Christ, and especially for that person who's stuck in it. Now, here in Hebrews 13, he says some other things that are interesting. Back up to uh, verse 7, and then we'll read verse 17. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Okay. Now, it's interesting here is that one of the things that uh, should be true of the pastors here Right? This is a weighty thing. Every time I think about this, it's just like when I hear what a husband is supposed to be when I read uh, my role in the wedding of Mike Pereira was to be a scripture reader. And what was I assigned to read? I read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That's what I read. I'm thinking about that. Greg, do I love my wife as Christ loved the church? Christ laid his life down for the church as the Savior. Christ willingly gave up the best for him so that we might have God's best. Is that characteristic of my life and relationship to Rana? I'm not going to ask her right now. I'll do that later. But the issue here when it comes to this, uh, I... The weight is on me 
because people at this church are encouraged to look at my life, it should be an example of what it means to follow Jesus. I have an obligation, therefore, to pursue Christ privately and on my own and in my home. I have an obligation to do that. All right, verse 17. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Right? Two insights here. Christians give up their independence to submit to their church leaders insofar as those leaders faithfully represent Christ's will for the church. Right? Uh, when we talk about the wisdom of what we do at Emmanuel, right, we involve all kinds of people in making decisions, but the way things are organized and different things is a lot of you come in and you, you step into the organization, you step into the programs, but you're not determining everything that happens, uh, but also you're not fighting everything that happens. And so we organize it, and we want to do it well. We want to get after the things that are important. But a lot of it, you're just coming in and submitting to the structures that we have that are already put up and, and going. Now, we're involved in them in many different ways, but the church is called, right, to follow the leaders that are given. And then the second, church leaders know who they are spiritually responsible for and will be held accountable by God for how they care for them. Now, this is weighty because I don't have responsibility for anyone who rejects me as a pastor. But I have responsibility for everyone who's come in as a member here. I'm accountable for their souls. Will is accountable for their souls. Pastor Van is accountable. Pastor Steve is accountable. We will be given account before God, and what Scripture teaches us is that I'll have a stricter judgment than you will. You can read about it in James chapter 3. I'll receive a stricter judgment. Right? So it's a weighty. And so I need to know who I'm accountable for. Who am I accountable for? And so I want to make sure that I'm accountable for them. Rana can tell you as I drove away yesterday from the wedding that I had here, and I just had a wonderful time yucking it up and laughing. We had, uh, I don't know what happened over that weekend. We got assigned to table eight at every reception we went to. We were just table eight people, I guess. I don't know what that means. Uh, but we were sitting there with two generations of the Jobsons sitting there with Van and Janelle. That was really the most difficult part of it. And then uh, we were sitting there. Uh, and, and as we were there, you know, you come away from that moment. There's always just an enjoyment at being with my brothers and sisters, and I truly did enjoy it. But also a reflection on whether I was the kind of person that I needed to be in that moment. It's always those always thoughts. So Ron, I can tell you as we, as we drive away, I'm, I'm kind of processing that in my head uh, in terms of those kinds of things. So... This is what we pick up. So a public character of membership. There seems to be something in the first century that they knew who their fellow brothers and sisters were because they knew who they were accountable for. And they knew who their pastor was, and their pastor knew who he was pastor of. Do you follow me on that? Right? So that's the first one. Okay, now the second one is the glory and goal of membership, right, if you're looking to fill things out. And here we're in Ephesians chapter 4. This is a passage we looked at a little bit last week, but... The goal of membership is that each member will enable the church to grow into maturity in Christ, okay? So this is interesting. The passage here in the middle of that is the goal, right? We will grow up to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ, right? So even as pastor talked about the mission of Emmanuel, to love one another into a growing relationship in Jesus Christ, so Jesus is who, who has acted to make possible this new life we have. He's the one whose death, burial, and resurrection, if we believe in him, that brought us into this body and made us a part of this group of people. He's brought us to each other. It's his in giving of the Spirit that has enabled us to live out this new life that he's given us in Christ. And as he's working in us through the Spirit, we're going to look like him when he's done with us. So Christ is the beginning, the middle, and the end of the Christian life. And so what we're doing as believers, I'm loving Andy, I should be, loving Andy as Christ would love him toward Christ. 
And Andy's doing that towards Sarah. And Marty's doing that towards Sarah, a different Sarah, just to be clear, right? And then, and then uh, uh, Grant is doing that toward Taylor. And we're doing that toward uh, Jason. Jason, he needs a lot of love. I'm just saying that. But we're going after him right? Going after people. But we know what the goal is, not, not to make somebody that I'm happy with, not to get somebody to do my bidding, not to make sure somebody elevates me. No, I know that I'm, I'm loving them well if I'm loving them the way Christ would love them. And at the end of the day, they're closer to Jesus by virtue of my relationship with them. They see him as more powerful, more central, more important. Their prayer life is directed toward him, right? They're encouraging other people to consider Jesus. That's what I'm trying to get to do with each person. And I want them to do that with me. So when they're walking in, right? And I know that as Barry was praying for me, as Terry Ertner was praying for me this week and let me know that he was praying for me, he wrote me and he said, Greg, I'm, I'm praying that today you'll be aware of God's presence and you'll walk with him and you'll be faithful. Why? Because that's the goal. And so from him, everything that we have to become what God wants us to be for our blessing, for his glory, comes from Jesus, and it's all heading toward him to become like him. And so that's the goal. So my goal is that, not a power base, not to elevate myself, not to get what I want. None of those kind of things are the goal. So the body of Christ and then the nature of membership, right, with this little rock formation here, is to be a member means that believers in, in, in church recognize that they are interdependent. We all need each other. No one can say they don't matter, and no one can say they don't need the others, right? Now, I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 12 with me, right? This is one of those to, to remind us, 1 Corinthians 12. Now, I know for some people, um, this, this passage pokes at your pride. You're not the center of the church that holds everything together. You're not the person that's the key to everything running. I don't even care if you're the person that's in a given ministry and you're, you're an important person in that ministry. You're not the center of it. And if you have made yourself the center or you think you're the center, then you've lost your way. Because everything doesn't rise and fall on you, it rises and falls on Jesus. And if you've, if you've made yourself that way, you've lost the sense of yourself. On the other hand, if you're sitting on the other side and you're saying, well, what do I have to offer? And some people say that, well, you don't know my past, my past disqualifies me. Or when I look around other people, I don't really know what I have to offer. Or I'm, I'm, an, I'm an introvert, I'm not an extrovert. Or I don't have these kind of things like that. Well, this passage comes like, no, 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 no. I know I should come in right now and go, oh no, you're really valuable. Don't say that about yourself. Paul wants to step in and say, excuse me, are you telling God that he's a liar? And you're saying, what? Excuse me, Greg, I'm not calling God a liar. No, God said that he gifted you and enabled you to be a part of this body. Are you telling him that he didn't? And then second, are you going to sit there and rob from God what he gave you for that body? So we have an obligation to step in to the responsibilities. Well, I don't know what it will be, right? But we're all thrown in because everybody's, there's no fans in the stands. Everybody's down on the playing field, right? So here's how Paul puts it in verse 12 of chapter 12. Just as the body, though one, has many parts, but its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ, for we were all put into by the Spirit, baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, right? And Paul says that because it doesn't make any difference what your ethnicity is. It doesn't make any difference what your socioeconomic status is or what education you have or don't have. We're all part of one body. We're all gifted with the same spirit. We've all been put into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're all members of one body. So, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. So Walter has every much, uh, much of the spirit as I have, right? So does Galen, so does Jim, right? So, so does uh, Sally, right? So everybody has the same spirit, the same resources from God. 
So we've got the same spirit. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, I would not for that reason stop being part of the body, right? Now you can say you're not happy, right? So let's say you're a foot today for the sake of the organization, right? I don't know who we want to choose as the honorary foot today. Davis, so we'll pick him right here. So the foot right here. Uh, and so you say a foot, and you're disappointed because when, when the train was going past God and he was putting, you know, different things in your car and you didn't get the looks or the brains, or, or the gifts, or the talents, or the speaking ability, and you're just sitting there, and you're just upset because you don't want to be a foot, okay? Well, that doesn't make you not a part of the body. You're still part of the body, and your, your beef is with God. Your beef is with God, and you're saying, God, I don't want to play the part that you wired me to play. I want to play that part, and God said, no, no. I want you to play, and you're absolutely essential to play that part. Where are we going to get if we don't have any feet? Going to get anywhere. So you need to be a foot. Okay, God. All right, help me to be the best foot I can. All right. And so I do not belong to the body. It would be not for that reason be not a part of it. Then verse 16, and if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God, this is a key thing here, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them just as he wanted them to be. Man. So you have the gifts, the wiring, the the background, and when he saved you and brought you in here, you need to bring all that right in here because your story is going to be important for us to grow into the people of God that God wants us to be. Your story of grace and mercy, your story of God using you, you of stepping in and leaning in on him through tragedy or following him through victories, right? Victories for Christians are as dangerous and more dangerous than tragedies. All those things, we need those. We need your quietness, we need your craziness, We need some of you that are verbal processors and then the other parts of you that hate verbal processors, right? We need you. We need all those people to come in to be a part of the body because God placed you here just as you are. Now, he's going to grow you to follow him, but we need you. And that's what Paul's saying here, right? We're part of the body. We're interdependent. I can't get by. This is one of the things, as a pastor, one of the red flags that goes up immediately. If I see a person going off on their own and disappearing from community. That's just a red flag right up the pole because that's unhealthy, right? And you can do it in two ways. You can literally leave. You can literally leave, but we all know as adults how to hide in plain sight, right? And if you organize yourself when you come all the time to avoid being known, to avoid being honest, to avoid letting people know who you are, right? You're hiding in plain sight and your gifts are not being poured into this body and people are not blessing you by you receiving their wisdom and their care, right? Those are the kinds of things we're interdependent. I need it, right? I need it. This last week, I needed other believers to give me some insight on how to deal with the tragedy that we're facing, Often I need my wife to wake me up when I've lost my way and I'm getting depressed, right? We need those things with each other, okay? Now, the challenge, right? Here's the challenge of church membership. You look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. We're almost getting done, so in case you're wondering. Ephesians chapter 4. This is always the problem with one of these review things. There's like 10 sermons in this one sermon, but... Chapter, one, chapter 4, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The very fact that Paul has to command that implies that that will be what the evil one will undermine. The Spirit of God is always marked by unity. The work of the evil one is always marked by division. Right? And so one of the challenges we have is that when you come into this body, some people, you're going to get treated badly from time to time. Somebody's going to be careless. Somebody's going to be thoughtless. Somebody's not going to be tuned in to what's going on. Somebody's going to forget your name for the third time. 
I've had people remind me of that painfully. Well, you met me once, like one year ago. You should remember. I said, I'm sorry. I don't. Right? So you'll have those kind of things, and it's just like a little punch in the nose, like, you know, right there. And you're just going, I was just trying to be friendly, and I just got a punch in the nose. Right? Or you come in, and you're depressed, or you're sad, or you're frustrated with what's going on at home. Right? Or somebody dropped the ball, and you come to church, and you were supposed to teach the kids this morning, and somebody that was supposed to show up didn't show up. All those kind of things are going to happen. Because what? We're fallen, broken people on the way. And it's our challenge to keep going back after each other. Any marriage that lasts, any friendship that lasts, right, is going to be because repeated attempts to make it, make it work. Right? So it's our challenge to pursue unity and overcome division. So here's some of the responsibilities. We don't have time to work through these in detail. But we're, you have a responsibility to know the Scriptures and protect the doctrinal integrity of the church. You have a responsibility to be Bible readers to be students of the Scripture, right? And if you need help with that, I as a pastor, Van, we'd love to help you with that, to get a program of reading, of study, right? Different issues if you want to go after them, we'll talk about those. But the church appoints and follows the church leaders, right? In our governance, the only reason that Will or Van or Steve are here is because the church affirmed us as elders, right? And so any future elders, by God's grace that we bring forward, which we hope in the year ahead, to do that, that it'll be affirmed by this church body. And the health of the leadership is directly tied to the spiritual depth of the congregation. Key thing. And then thirdly, to love and serve their fellow members, right? Galatians 6 is an important one there. You ought to read that. If I see somebody who's wandering off and I see they're wandering off, I need to go after them and try to bring their life back together like mending a net that's starting to fray. Romans 12, I always think Alan's here. Yeah, Alan's sitting here right here. Alan's the shadowy figure in our drummer cage up here, in case you wondered who the creepy guy was up here in the drummer cage. That's Alan. He's really a nice guy. It just makes him look creepy up here. Uh, but when Alan's sitting there, well, I always remember when I go to Romans 12, when Alan came through the membership class, I remember him reading that as a part of our membership class. And I know I've said this before, and he said to me, and I think it's okay for me to say, Alan, you can go after me afterwards. But, but, he, but he said, you know, I was reading this, this, this one phrase, and it says, be devoted to one another. And he says, that's not true of me. Uh, you know, when I, I came with my parents when I was young, you know, I just came and went when they left because I was in their car. But, you know, I, I drive my own car now. And when I come to church, it's hard to be devoted to people you don't know. And what I usually do is I just come to church, and I just leave right after church. And so I don't know. I don't know people. I think I need to hang around and get to know people. I said, that's a good takeaway, right, from that one, right? So be devoted. And then to regularly assemble together with each other, right? I, we need to have our eyes on each other, right? I see Ruby and Josh here today and Maritza, and I had a conversation with Maritza this week that was so encouraging, right, about those. We pray for Ruby and Josh and Dulce, right? We pray for them as a family, but you know, one of the things that we often did, I know I've shared this with you before, but as a family, as our girls were growing up, one of the things we tried to hold on to at all costs, even though it was constantly attacked, we wanted to sit down at supper and eat supper together. And, and some of it wasn't because we just had all these conversations planned. We just wanted to put our eyes on people and see them. How are you doing? Right? So I know I said this to Mayor Mays this morning. I've known her long enough that when I was looking at her this morning, she was a little stressed today. Right? Now, she's probably only stressed like every Thursday once a month, something like that. But I looked at her today, and she was just a little stressed from things that are going on. Uh, I know my wife when I come in if she's stressed. And also, my wife will tell me that she's stressed, right, in terms of that. So when we were going down to that wedding, the backstory about going to that, and that wedding on Friday is that we left just, we had two and a half hour drive, and we left with two and a half hours to make it. And of course, what happened, it rained on the way down. There was a car accident on the way down. One of the worst things in Rana's life to ever have happen, right? This is next to like death and other things like that, is to be late to anything. So she was sitting there just, you know, inside her soul, holding this thing there, all the way down. I said, honey, we'll make it, right? And then, of course, we're almost there with like five minutes away. And so I, I, I text the, the groom to tell him, I may not be there. You may have to find another reader 
for this passage, right? I'm sure somebody else can read, right, in terms of that. But you had to find that. Then he writes back to me and says, don't worry, we're delaying the start of the wedding because there was a big accident on the road and nobody else is here. And I said, okay, right? So we got there on time, did our little reading and those things like that, but it was a little bit of a tense two and a half hour drive, right? Wasn't the, the, our most, you know, encouraging, delightful moment, right? In terms of that, but we need to put our eyes on each other. We need to see each other. You need to be seen. You need to be seen. John walked in today. I'm praying for John. The heavy thing that he's carrying, he and Lynn. I wanted to look on his face and ask him how he's doing today. You need to be seen. You need to have people that are looking at you and talking to you, and you need to be seen. You need to assemble. So here's all the different things. We don't have time to go through them. This is a picture that came from an earlier time, right, where the body of Christ, where the temple, where the Spirit of God dwells, where His family, where the people that are proclaiming the gospel, and we're involved in following the leader, we're involved in sharing our gifts, we're involved in encouraging one another. Sometimes we have to discipline each other when we lose our way. We get together and pray. We love one another and comfort one another. We study the scriptures together. We worship together, all because we've linked arms as a people who have been made this new covenant people. Those are the things that God calls us to do. And every day, so we're evaluating a church. Are we, are we doing well as a church? Or are we doing these things? Are we doing those things? You can't measure those things in budget. You can't measure those things in facilities. You can't measure those things, Right? This is what we're looking for. This is why when Van talks about here, one of the things that is very encouraging to us as pastors is to see relationships happening horizontally. Because we know that that's what the Spirit does. The Spirit moves people toward each other. And you need people. You need to be loved. And you need people to love in this body. Now, let me end... Uh, I won't be able to uh, go through everything here, but this is our church covenant, and this is online, and I want to encourage you to, to read it, and this is a good occasion, right, on a Memorial Day weekend. Uh, my mom, I just keep thinking about this, this, is something I think that's lost, I was thinking about it this morning. My mom, as has been her pro- pro- uh, um, practice over the years, she will go to my father's grave on Monday. She will go there, and my dad was a war vet. I was a Korean in the Korean War. And she will go there, and she will decorate his tomb. She'll visit her mom and her dad. She'll visit her brothers and sisters. And she'll remember. And she'll cry. And she'll talk about uh, the good things and the things that she misses and the longed-for reunion that she anticipates, right? And it's good for us to remember, and she'll do that this weekend. Above all, we of all people, as Kristen reminds us, we ought to be the people who regularly remember what Christ has done, right? That undergirds all of life with hope and purpose and meaning and deliverance. That makes my mom's hope for a reunion a real hope. All those things, we ought to be people who remember. And a part of that, we ought to remember what God has called us to do and to be for our blessing, for our protection, and for the blessing and protection of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we covenant, therefore, through the truth of God's Word and by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of the church in knowledge, holiness, comfort. Comfort there is knowing the comfort of God in the midst of tragedy to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain its worship and ordinances, to dis- its discipline and doctrines, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expense of the church, the relief of the poor, our, our, our uh, benevolent offering, and the spread of the gospel through all the nations, our missionaries that we support uh, uh, throughout the world and locally. We also covenant to maintain a personal walk with God, to spiritually train our children, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances, 
to walk circumspectly in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements. It should be the fact that I should not have to live down your reputation as a follower of Jesus in Xenia. Nor should you have to live down my reputation. That you come to me and go, are you, do you know Greg Kowser? And you say, yeah. Man, he's a piece of work. He's a piece of work. What do you mean he's a piece of work? Well, you know, I've had some dealings with him and he's just, you know, he, he loses himself. He's unkind. He's, you know, okay. Well, that then is affecting you. That's what we mean here. I represent you. You represent me. We represent Jesus. Right? So, um, an exemplary part. To avoid bad reports, slander, divisive words, deeds, sinful anger, to abstain from any behavior that would hurt or harm the reputation of Christ, and to be zealous in our efforts to advance the message of our Savior at home and around the world. That's what Van prayed about today. We further covenant to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy and feeling and courtesy and speech, to be slow to take offense but always ready for forgiveness and reconciliation, to be mindful of the rule of our Savior which taught us to forgive as we have been forgiven. We moreover covenant that when we remove from this place, we will unite with some other church as soon as possible because this is what we believe God calls us to do and to be. So this is why we put it this way, to be a member. To be a member means that a public formal agreement, a covenant, has been made between the church and an individual Christian. This formal agreement they enter into sets out the responsibilities of each party. The church agrees to affirm the Christian's relationship with God and to oversee the Christian's discipleship and the Christian promises to invest in and submit to the church. So, I'll end here. And Kristen, will you, you guys come back here and uh, we'll sing here at the end. And we have one short uh, issue of business right afterwards to actually elect a deacon, we hope, uh, uh, here in just a moment. Um, but my, my question is here is just how are we doing, right? How are we doing with our obligations? Are we trusting Jesus that to be enmeshed in the right way within our community is what God calls us to do and to be? Um, here's a very simple, practical way, right? You guys recognize this? It says Emmanuel Baptist Church prayer prompts from the EBC Church Covenant. This is a list of uh, all of our members right here. Uh, one of the obligations that we have is to pray for each other. And we just reprinted these, updated them, did some things here. And, of course, uh, we now have them in lavender. They're much more attractive colors. Uh, that. But uh, I want to encourage you, this is at baseline. If you're not praying for the people of God, you need to be praying. Right? And you need to get this. I, I felt convicted. Ron and I, I, I know I've done this, and we, we've yet to fully implement it. Uh, but we have our own little list, and now I'm going to have to get a new one now that's updated. But I put a little hook right by our door because Ron and I, we walk out in the morning. And uh, we walk the dogs and we pray together as we walk up and down Bell Road. Um, and one of the things that, that happens sometimes, your prayer life gets in a rut or you only pray for the same things all the time. And so I hung a little hook there and I punched a hole in this little, little thing and hung it there so that it's right by the door. When we go out, we can pick it up and we won't have to go try to find it. All right, when we go to look for it. Uh, and I want to pray through it and pray for you. Right? I think of the... Uh, well, it's a good way to get the names of people. It's a good way to follow up and have conversations with people, right? So I'm, I'm looking at Darcy back here. I'm praying for her. She starts college in the fall. She's going to start at Cedarville. I can't wait to persecute her when she gets in a classroom. I've never had that opportunity. I've never had that opportunity before, and I'm just looking forward. She, she cannot avoid me. I'm going to try to talk to her advisor, make sure she gets in there. Uh, so we'll do those things. But, but we need, by God's grace. Crystal, will you sing?